All right, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is uh, Corona Watch. Right now, it's the most important program we have. Stephanie Dalton and Winston Welsh join us for a discussion of how Corona is doing this week. Very scary. Let's talk first about the, the, uh, the speed and spread of the epidemic. It's been declared by the World Health Organization, finally, took them a while, as a global pandemic. So, Stephanie, what does this mean and how fast is it spreading? Um, and what, you know, what are the boundaries here, if any? Well, I think we're getting a sense of that through uh, the television portrayals of the states infected uh, and shown on maps. I, that, that's how I'm tracking it, and it's going very fast. In just a few days, it'll go from one state to another. I mean, we started with, what, one or two? And now we're up to 36 is the last count I heard this morning. So it's going very fast. And then within it, the geometric progression of the infections is, is terrifying, frankly. Um, and uh, people need to take precautions. You know, every time you look, there's more countries involved. Last I looked uh, was something in the 70s, in the middle 70s. And that, for all purposes, that's pretty much the whole world. Um, so, you know, what's the sense, though? This is, it's like hard to imagine, isn't it, Winston? It's hard to imagine how fast, like a brush fire moving as fast as you, like those fires in California. Every time you look, boom, it's another mile ahead. Yeah, it's a good analogy because those fires can pop up, the embers can travel uh, like a mile down the road. So even though it may not be right next to you, it pops up a mile down the road. And uh, trying to get ahead of that is near impossible. I saw that Sacramento, um, yesterday has given up on the idea of containment they're just going for uh they're not even saying to self-quarantine anymore they're just saying if you feel ill then then quarantine but if you're not feeling ill and you think you've been exposed you still got to go to work and the reason for that was because you had one case come in from what i read uh, in the sacramento b i think that said um and they they ended up it was a patient who they did not test for corona initially i believe and they ended up putting out over 100 people doctors nurses um, anybody that might have come in con cleaning people uh, in contact with them so they realized they were quickly going to run out of um of healthcare workers if they followed this policy so they've changed that and from what i understand as well the response now is basically local it's state um, obviously, we have some federal um, involvement here, but I think they're just going to try a whole bunch of different things and see what works on the ground because those people got to deal with it right there. Oh, scary. And, you know, if you look at the numbers, you, you find that Europe has, uh, you know, country by country in Western Europe, they have like 1,200 cases. Italy has lots more, um, but the UK has three or 400 cases. There's no country, you know, that, not even small countries that are, that are, are exempt. Um, and the U.S. is right up there. It's not quite as high as France or Germany, but it's uh, a thousand cases right now and, and climbing. Um, so what's, what's happening is this wildfire we're talking about manages to cross the border, crest, cross the world. And we should talk later about how biologically it could do that. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that <clears throat> the U.S. Um, as a country has failed to contain it has failed to come up with a policy, and it is now incumbent on the states. So we have uh, well, you know, the federal system. The states are trying to do things. The states are making a decision, uh, as in Sacramento, to contain or not contain, um, which may or may not you know, be the best thing. And then the, the federal government, its participation here has been to provide kits or not provide kits. And if you said to yourself, gee, I have a bad headache and I'm sweating, <clears throat> and I'm coughing, and I, you know, my chest is tight and all that, um, you know, you don't really have a lot of options, not here, not in any state. What are you going to do? And you don't want to infect anyone else. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, Stephanie? Well, the, the federal level has certainly not, not met its expectations for helping the nation along. And, of course, in that case, the states have to take it on, um, whether, whether they would... Um, take that leadership role with without a partnership with the feds is is something we can't we, we're going to find out about because I, I hope the federal level is taking is is getting up to speed providing the diagnostics and um, the information and uh, building the government in the direction 
encouraging the work to come out of the government at the level that the U.S. is uh, usually functioning. I think that uh, we've just lost our leadership position uh, in the world, much less nationally, for taking control or being a resource for everyone to get through this in the best way possible. So I think the states are going to have to step up and do what they need to do. And um, without, without that um, in operation, I think that they, they could be lauded for doing a better job than the federal level has been able well, to Well, yeah, do. but even then, you know, you have this thing moving so fast and we don't know that much about it and how it moves. And, and so, it, you know, in the end, in the end, it goes from federal, not doing anything, state, really not able to do that much. Uh, and then the person, the person. And so you have to look at the individual. You, the individual, have to look at how you modify your behavior. So, Winston, how have you modified your behavior? How will you modify your behavior? Well, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm a bit of a germaphobe like the president, and so I, I use typical things like, uh, you know, an extra paper towel to open the, the doors uh, from the bathroom and that sort of thing, but, uh, and very aware of when, I, you know, shake hands, and that is going out of uh, style, and I love what the uh, uh, Secretary General, I believe, of the WHO did, and he does this hand to his heart and bows, and that's the new handshake for him. I like that. You can do the, uh, the Vulcan symbol as well. I, or Japanese bow. I think all those are great and a uh, long time coming. So these are basic things we can do, but as, as we're learning more, I think the effort now is on, um, if we're going moving towards containment, it's social distancing, it's canceling essentially everything. Um, f from what I can understand, to not because we're gonna slow the numbers of people that get sick, although that might happen, but it's to spread out the illnesses so that the healthcare services can actually cope with the numbers that are gonna come down the pike. Um, and it's also to save yourself. It's also to save yourself, but I, you know, I, I think that when, when we talk about the local responses, in a state like Hawaii, where we are so vulnerable, to everything here, our shipping, everything that comes in here, we actually, everybody that comes here has to land on a plane. There's a few people that come by boat, but basically if we have a small number of cases here and we can isolate those folks and everybody who gets off in this state gets um, a check or maybe the, I don't know, the, maybe the state just says, um, yeah, we're going to, it would kill the tourism industry, so it won't happen. But you could say, like Israel, there's going to be a two-week quarantine on you if you come to Hawaii. So, you know, enjoy your hotel room if you come. It's not going to happen, but it's a way that it could actually be kept out of this state. Now, this virus is, uh, Secretary Azar of Health and Human Services said, we should plan on this for the duration of the year and maybe longer. Um, and it's got a ways to burn. So we just got to hunker down, take self-care, wash your hands twice. You're supposed to sing the alphabet song slowly. I say once for bulk, twice for remainder. So wash twice and um, don't be afraid to use paper towels if you can get them. So let me summarize that for a minute. <clears throat> you're washing your hands. Um, you are distancing yourself. You're never touching anybody. Don't touch your head. Don't. Well, yeah, but that part of washing your hands, I think, you know, in other words, if you've touched some surface that has a virus on it and, you, and um, then you wash your hands, it's probably okay to touch your face because there's probably no, vi probably no virus or less virus on your hands. I mean, if you do both, you're safer, but you know, that's kind of where it ends. I don't hear a lot of talk about masks. Maybe I should be. You didn't mention anything about masks. Stephanie, what about masks? Are you wear? Do you have a mask in your pocketbook, Stephanie? I want to know now. I do. I had a, I have masks more than one, so that I can help out if needed. But the masks are um, only about containing one's own infectious situation, not spreading one's own problems out to others. It's not such a protection from the virus coming inside. Uh, and I haven't, I've seen, uh, for instance, in these condo instructions uh, for, for if the virus takes off here and we do need to, to self-quarantine, there are some, some recommendations that don't 
involve masks so much as they do shutting down all of the amenities so that no one can congregate anywhere. And But one of the things that's been troublesome in seeing some of the lists of condos that are putting out this guidance of what they can do is something like the mail room. In the mail room, you just have walls and tables and just covered with everybody touching and moving materials around. And you have them. mail. And then that there's was the mail. By somebody else somewhere else. Exactly, which is of course a problem in the school, in school where you're collecting papers back and forth and, and on all of those papers, K through 12 or preschool kids too, you're handling the same uh, papers and uh, getting that same contamination that the little kids can uh, produce for on their, on their work. Yeah, I, so I, I think too, there's the issue of the elevator. We haven't had enough guidance about how we're gonna get up and down in these big tall buildings. I think the mask would be helpful because we're in such close spaces in the elevator. But uh, I think we need a little more guidance than just use your knuckle to push the button. So um, we've got that to help well, us some along. Help. And as then not you touch your wash face. Wash your hands right afterward. Mm -hmm. So but, if I have a family, okay, I live with a family. Most people live with families. I mean, that's the desired, well, for most people, that's the desired approach. And I feel mm, that I need a self-quarantine. What about my family who doesn't necessarily feel they need a self-quarantine? Um, do, do, I, do I live in the same house with them? Um, do I eat from the same table? Do I touch the same utensils? Um, do I use the same bathroom? Do I use the same, all those things that living together. Or do I send them away? Or do I go? Where do we go? To a hotel room? I don't know where I go. Mm -hmm. I, I may feel I need to save them or mm -hmm. save myself by separating. It's a real concern, isn't it? Yes. Well, yes. Winston, what do you do for that? Well, I think if you, you know, the, the reality is from what I've been reading, what the news has been going out there, Chancellor Merkel of Germany said 40 to 70 percent of people can expect to get this in Germany. I think we're not going to be that much different than Germany. Um, so you're probably going to get it. Most people, it says it, it's not going to be something that's super serious, but if you're one that it does get serious and uh, potentially very serious, then obviously you're looking at a different uh, scenario. So each of us needs to be as prepared as possible for our families. We need to stock up on, on things. It's not so much hoarding as just being prepared, you know, the, uh, having uh, reasonable supplies of food, uh, electrolyte replacements, so that if, you, if you're sick, but it's more like a normal, um, uh, sickness where you're not completely incapacitated or needing hospitalization, you're still going to need your chicken soup and your Gatorade to, to feel better. And then after a couple of weeks, if you can isolate inside of your own house and you have your room where that's where you, uh, you stay, and maybe if you're sharing a bathroom, uh, you get a can of Lysol. So after you touch something, you're, you're fastidious and make sure that you're doing all you can to protect the others in your home. Why don't you have the others go shopping for you? Have Safeway deliver. Safeway delivers. Okay. Well, I guess my, my question is, and Stephanie, maybe you have an idea about this, is um, wh why two weeks? Some, sometimes they say a month. And uh, what do I get? Do I get water? Do I get soup? Um, do I get all kinds of food? And how much medicine in advance should I get? I mean, I, you get various advice from various sources, not the same. I, I wish somebody would standardize it or give me a handle on why. But, but really, if, if, uh, if the drugstore is still open, why do I need to get a month? Is the drugstore going to close? Is there any real chance it's going to close? Is the food store going to close? Is there going to be a supply chain problem about food? How much food should I get? Well, I think uh, all, of that is, the, all of those are excellent questions because depending on how deeply infested our nation is or various states, we will face or not face that situation. We could face no, uh, certainly here in Hawaii, there can be no food and there can be no supplies as there are no supplies, no masks are available and won't be for a while. So we are really vulnerable here in Hawaii, even more so than on the mainland. So I, I think these things need to be considered and we do need those kinds of supplies in case it gets to be that bad, but hopefully we're catching up on the work that needs to be done to know how to handle this situation. Well, from and your lips to God's ears. Well, Winston? you know, I think that we've got some really great 
um, guidelines out there that the state and the city have come out with after our missile scare last year and we realized or it, it, it they the state exactly gives you a list of what you need to have and the city whatever's on it i would say double it right um, i think the mormons are right they keep six months of food or maybe a year of food that they rotate out uh, we're obviously not and everyone's not going to go be able to be, uh, buy a year worth of food but they can probably uh, stock up and have a couple weeks or a month worth of food and just stack stack it over in the corner if you have a small place uh, be prepared if it turns out that you don't need it and you and you want to uh, rotate it out there's going to be plenty of people here in food banks that need uh, you to donate that so um, I think it's a wise idea for us to all go online go to the, the honolulu.gov see what their recommendations are see if that feels reasonable for you or if you need to double it um, I think the last time I heard, even though a lot of these things say two weeks supply, they actually came out last year and said, you really should have a month supply in case of tsunami, earthquake, epidemic, uh, and a month supply. The, the way to think of it is like this, Jay. I think not only are you gonna have to provide for yourself, I've been in a major disaster before where I had three different refugees after an earthquake who came to live with me. So I had supplies, fortunately, for everybody at that time. Um, but uh, it's not always the case, but you can think that maybe you're not just going to be providing for yourself or your family, well, but someone else. I think that's a else. really, really important point. And in fact, uh, you know, the Nextdoor website, the Nextdoor social media, yeah. um, they suggest that you think along those lines, that you think to help your neighbor. And because your neighbor may need, may be desperate for some help and it'd be nobody else but people in the neighborhood. And that goes further. It goes further to a kind of mindset about caring about your community, caring about your, your society, however large or small it may, may be. And Hawaii is like famous for that, I think. Um, and it, we may find ourselves in a, in a test for that. And well, so how far, how far c can you plan to go, Stephanie? Yes, I, I'm going back to thinking of the uh, of Ebola crisis that happened a couple of years ago. And uh, what you say, is very worrisome because we do have a uh, family and aloha here and that involves touching and hugging and those kinds of things but even in the home working or serving um, a sick person uh, these precautions need to be taken and that was one of the ways they were able to break the Ebola uh, contamination because people were touching and helping and and even after death they were preparing and actually doing cultural Things with their and their, um, you know, faith-based uh, approaches to m managing their dead uh, loved ones. So I, I, all of those things had to be broken. Those deep cultural practices and these loving bonds have to be reconsidered when you're up against such an infectious agent as this this virus seems to be. Yeah. So we face a lot of challenges yeah, in addition to the, logistic, yeah. the logistics of getting the food in. I noticed that all the sardines were gone at the place I went. <laughs> and then um, tuna was low. Uh, a lot of people were grabbing the spam. But so th this is real. So people are actually taking um, I think that's going to continue seriously. Uh, so Winston, you know, one of the things that has been discussed, and in fact, uh, Josh Green, Lieutenant Governor and a doctor has been here think a couple of times and one of the points he's discussed is is testing you know <clears throat> for a while the state of Hawaii had no no testing kits uh, and the CDC blew it on providing testing kits we talked about last hour um, but you know do we have testing kits now um, the the tests they reported a, a week ago there was six tests six tests and and uh, I, th I think and maybe one was found positive or maybe none the, the problem is who do you test and that depends on that depends on how many test kits you have now in in korea they have a lot of cases but maybe they have a lot of cases because they've tested a lot of people they, they have drive-by testings mm -hmm. uh where you can get tested and you can know the result pretty quick mm -hmm. this is really good i, I haven't noticed any drive-by testing uh, here and i don't think there will be any in the near term and and furthermore i i, I think that we don't have the kits to do anything uh, I just, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just saw right before the show that Urgent Care Hawaii is going to be offering drive-by testing. Really? Yeah. Well, that's, so, a, that's, a, that's an advance. It's an advance. And I think, you know, humans are very resourceful people. Um, while this is going to be changing our, our society in ways that we can't quite imagine yet, um, 
there's going to be a lot of good things that come out of it too, and a lot of um, things, unintended consequences, good and bad. The world of remote meetings and remote work is certainly going to increase out of this because people are going to realize I really didn't need to see that person in person when I could handle this. So we're going to be a little bit more electronically changed probably, but um, on in other ways there's going to be new types of civic groups and communities and perhaps we will get out and meet our neighbors a little bit more and see if they need something and see how they're doing because uh, it's going to be up to us. Their son might be trapped in the in the mainland and not be able to come and look after them or, or whatever it is. So we do need to look out for each other. We do need to uh, reinvest in our humanity um, and and just and delve in and, and just just rediscover our you know, humanity that, that, that's been so lost that's in the, the last biggest threat years. of all. Stephanie, I want to talk about uh, the plague for a minute. Okay, the, the, <laughs> the bubonic plague, the black well, plague. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Black Plague, uh, smallpox, what have you, you know, uh, millions of people, millions of people were killed. Oh, millions. A, a good, a, a big percentage of Europe died. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the Middle East, I think, also had mm -hmm. it. It was really devastating. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, one, one, uh, one conclusion that uh, John David Ann made, he's a history professor at HBU, and he comes on and talks about this, um, was that in the history of the plague, um, it set Europe you're back by hundreds of years. He said 300 years mm -hmm. of a, you know, of a, a backward turn. It, 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 and they had to catch up later. All the initiatives, the enlightenments, the, the sciences, the arts are all, you know, stuck because of the plague and because so many people were killed. Um, and, and what Winston said is, is really resonant, you know, we have to avoid that. We don't yeah. want to have that happen to us. We want to be smarter than they were uh, back in the, in the 14th century. Um, so my question to you is, how do we do that? How do we do that now? How do we change our mindset so it's not panic and it's not isolation, you know, physically and mentally? It's, it's something more human. How do we do that? Well, I think there's an example of that that just happened, but I, I understand what you're saying. We need to protect ourselves and take precautions for the, uh, to prevent the infection and infection spreading. But we also need to preserve our knowledge base. So if the if the numbers get high enough, it can erode the knowledge base, which is what, of course, happened during these other uh, infectious plagues that had we that occurred over the Middle Ages, and uh, and we had to suffer for that and start over. But what I had recently happen is a conference I was scheduled to go to in San Francisco in the middle of next month. So just this week, they finally made a decision about what to do. Uh, with that conference, which what has international attendance as well as national attendance. And so about 15,000 people were already signed up for this annual conference that everybody goes to uh, who's in the, in the profession that it represents. And um, it turns out that they have shifted from having um, a place-based conference over to having an online conference. So now they're, uh, now they're preparing for everybody to be uh, engage with the conference through their computers and their online resources. And I mean, if they can make this happen, it will certainly be a model for others. So it will show that we don't have to cancel the important conference that brings together the thinkers and the producers of knowledge, but we can shift into our technological well, capacity. That raises that an have. interesting question. Is, a, is an electronic conference as good? Well, uh, you, you know, missed, this morning yeah. I got a notice from the, the NAB, <laughs> uh, the National Association of Broadcasters, mm -hmm. which Carol Mon Lee have, and I have attended a couple of times. And uh, when you go to one of those, it takes the whole conference center at uh, Las Vegas, 100,000 people plus, mm -hmm. and are all, you know, together, sharing, you know, communicating, mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. It's quite an experience. You, you know, your, your, your mind is, is filled with new ideas. Absolutely. And you can't do that as well. Um, on, well, a, on a machine. Well, so the question see. I put to yeah. you, uh, Winston, I put this to you, is can, will this cause better, more robust technology for remote connection so as to replace the idea of a physical conference? The, uh, there's no doubt that it's already happening. Uh, like uh, Stephanie said, her conference is going online. But humans are social creatures. We want to get together. We want to go to church. We want to go to our, our neighborhood board meetings. We want to go to conferences. That It's going to continue. You know, we saw what happened with SARS or even bad influence of outbreaks. 
we'll figure this one out. You know, like I said, humans are very resourceful. We've already sequenced the genome of this, which means, and the discoveries that come out of this are going to bleed through to other um, viral issues, perhaps um, cancer, where, where we're going to gain a lot as well from this as much as we lose. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to realize that even in China, where people were on lockdown for the last two months, the stores are still open. They People are getting food. They're getting medicine as they need it now. There might be some runs on certain things like masks because everybody went out and bought those right away or Purell or uh, toilet paper here in Hawaii. But they're, the supply chains are going to be kept open. And so we don't need to hoard and panic. We just need to be prepared um, in a way that we always should be prepared. So nothing new about that. And our, our economy will it's going to suffer a little bit. There's no two ways about it, but uh, I think that we're gonna come back and we will be fine. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but uh, we're resilient people. Okay, we gotta play some music now, some uplifting music. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could sing for us, Jay. Yes, yes. No, no, you don't want that, trust me. But well, you know what this, this raises, you know, the, the, the fact, you know, you talk about the, the medicine and the, and the science and all that. And our government under Trump has, has pedaled backward at a rapid rate to avoid science, uh, defund the CDC, defund uh, you know, the teams that are, have been organized in earlier administrations mm -hmm. to deal with epidemics. And we now know that epidemics are endemic. We're going to have them, as you, as you mentioned. Um, we're going to have a virus today, another one tomorrow, another one tomorrow. It's just the, the human condition. Uh, the human condition now includes viruses. And the question, the question I have in my mind is, you know, we were really caught short on this one. We don't have a cure. We, we have a treatment, but it's imperfect. And we are at 18 months, everybody says 18 months, it may be more uh, to a vaccine. Um, we, we, are, we should be ashamed of ourselves that we didn't prepare for this because scientists have known for a long time that, that uh, you know, epidemics lead to pandemics, lead to endemics. So my question is, um, you know, are we going to be able to really learn here? Or is this the kind of thing in the human condition where you only attend to it as in the plague when it's eating you? Um, and then you go back to complacency afterward. Can we, uh, can we actually hold the thought on this or will we re return to complacency? I just wanted to mention that the Hanta virus was one of these situations that the CDC what became famous over along with the University of New Mexico Medical School. So it's not so long ago, 20 years ago, that we had that in the four corners of the Southwest. So we did learn a lot, and hopefully that's just a small example. Well, Winston, close. Give them the wisdom you've been dying to give them. Oh, you know what? I, I remain optimistic that uh, humans can uh, overcome this, and we're going to learn. We might get complacent again, but uh, we're going to learn a lot of lessons out of this, and uh, we're going to be okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Watch this. Thank you, guys. Mahalo. Mahalo.